gentlemen, and welcome back to Corona Chemistry. This is the second official video in this quarantine period in which we are trying to dish out some chemistry resources for you guys to utilize at home in your at-home learning. And today the topic is electron configuration and everything that goes with it. Uh, there's three formats to it. Uh, and that is the full electron configuration, noble gas configuration, and something that is called orbital notation. All have their uses, all have their benefits, and all have their scenarios in which you would like to use them in. Uh, but we're also going to talk about the concepts having to do with electron configuration, including valence electrons and Lewis dot structures towards the end of this video. So stay tuned for that if that's something that you need. Either way, we're going to try to do this in one fail swoop, one recording, so that almost no editing needs to take place. Wow. This guy is going to be impressive. So here we are, electron configuration, which is a big fancy way uh, of giving us a, a, an ability to look at how these electrons are positioned and structured around the atom and also enables us to discuss and have conversations about certain individual electrons and some, some of their functionalities. So either way, what we're looking at here is one of the first images you probably ever saw when you were in school. Probably in middle school, you saw these Bohr models of atoms. Well, the only bad thing about them is that they're actually incredibly inaccurate, except for the element hydrogen. The reason why it's accurate for hydrogen is because hydrogen only has one electron, typically. And so when the negatively charged electron is attracted to the positively charged nucleus, well, then, of course, the only pathway that it can take is a circular path. But as you're adding more and more electrons to this electron cloud, well, they're all negatively charged. And as Paula Abdul says in her hit 90 single, opposites attract like charges repel. So all of these negatively charged electrons do not want to be next to each other. So if we're adding more and more electrons, things are going to get a little more complicated. And so when we look at this aluminum atom image on the right, this is not accurately how these electrons are positioned around the atom. So let's discuss a few terms before we go into uh, the, the shapes or actual pathways of these electrons. First of all, the energy level is going to be which ring the electron is on. For example, in this aluminum atom, we have three rings of electrons, therefore energy level one, energy level two, energy level three, if you're following along with my computer cursor there. Next, we have an orbital, which is actually a path of an electron. We also have sublevels, which is the shape of the orbital, otherwise known as the type of the path that it's going to take. Well, there's actually four different types of paths, and theoretically, there's more types of paths. We just haven't had a need uh, to fill that yet with, with how many elements we currently have on the periodic table. But as it stands right now, there's four different shapes of pathways that they can take on, and they each get their own letter abbreviation, S, P, D, and F. And now, I'm not sure where the other letters come from, but S is the only intuitively one. Uh, an S sublevel is spherically shaped. And if you take any sphere, any perfect sphere, uh, some sort of, let's see, if you, if you ever played squash in a little squash court, right, it's a perfectly round, usually just one color ball, right? And no matter which way you look at it, it looks the exact same. Look at it from the top, the bottom, the left, the right, it all is the same. There's only one perspective, one viewpoint, one orientation for it. Well, for the other three sublevels, P, D, and F, it gets increasingly more complicated. And the P sublevel is actually known as a dumbbell, a dumbbell sublevel. Now, I love dumbbells. I don't really get a dumbbell vibe from it, but that's the official chemistry name for the shape here. And actually, if you look at it, it has three different orientations. You can look at it just left to right, holding it in front of you. You can look at it up and down, right, vertically, or three-dimensionally, you can make it put one of the faces in front of you and going away from you. That is a third orientation for that dumbbell shape. Well, if you look at the D sublevel, we're getting a little more complicated. Uh, the first four orientations, first four perspectives you see here, kind of looks like a flower to me with four petals on it. But then, oh my goodness, what is going on here? This fifth perspective, this fifth orientation, kind of looks like two pacifiers on top of each other. I like to call it a double binky. And then the F sublevel, it's actually hard to get um, a lot of simulations for what this looks like online. But there's actually seven different ways you can look at this F sublevel. And so if you look at this pattern here, S, there's only one way. P, there's three ways, D, there's five ways, and F, there's seven ways. So notice that it goes up by two different orientations each time. And your number of orientations 
determines how many orbitals you have in that sublevel. And that is a fixed number. Okay, that is a fixed number. So let's look at what the beginnings of this electron configuration is going to look like. Well, we're going to use a certain notation here. And it looks a little like this. You have a coefficient, a letter, and then a, and then a subscript. Okay, sorry, not a subscript, superscript. Oh my goodness, sub versus super, a superscript. And they each have their own meaning. The coefficient is going to tell you which ring you're on, which energy level you're on. The letter is going to denote, denote which sublevel or which shape of path that you're on, S, P, D, or F. And then the superscript is going to tell you how many electrons are actually in that sublevel. So this one, for example, is saying on the first ring in the S sublevel, there's two electrons. That's all it's saying here. Okay, so now let's look at these fixed numbers going off of that image a couple of slides ago, right? With all the different perspectives of these sublevels, that is going to once again tell us how many orbitals they have. Well, think of an orbital like a bunk bed. You've got a bed on top, you've got a bed on bottom. So you can actually fit two electrons in one orbital. Okay, so the S sublevel has one orbital, one orientation, and yet can fit a total of two electrons. OK, the P sublevel has three different perspectives and therefore can fit a total of six electrons. If you had three bunk beds in a room, you could sleep six people comfortably. And the D sublevel has five orbitals, therefore 10 electrons. And the F sublevel has seven orbitals, as we just saw a couple of slides ago, uh, therefore can hold 14 electrons comfortably. So notice the orbitals go up by two with each uh, each change of the sublevel and the electrons actually go up by four with each change of the sublevel and so we have a question here hydrogen has one electron using the diagram that we are going to see and actually the diagram you see directly above my head what is the electron configuration of hydrogen going to be well what i'd first like us to discuss is actually uh the the first type of notation that we're going to look at which is orbital notation i don't usually teach it this way but to help Ms. Boyd out, we're going to talk about orbital notation first. So shout out to Ms. Boyd. Wow. Wow. So we're going to look at orbital notation, which means we're going to look at all of the principles that electron configuration has to offer in one fail swoop. Okay. So starting off with what is known as Offba principle, an obviously very German name, simply states that electrons are going to enter the orbitals from the lowest energy to the highest energy possible. Well, just think of it like a parking garage, right? If I'm going to the mall, right, to go get myself a nice Gucci belt or a Louis Vuitton AirPod case for $89.99, I'm getting totally ripped off, but I'm going to the mall for this very specific item. And as long as I'm not driving a $500,000 car, I'm not too worried about where I'm parking, right? If I'm driving a $500,000 car, maybe I go to the roof without exception just to make sure that I, I can park away from everyone else. But if I'm not driving that, I don't care. I'm going to take the first spot that's available. And so in the picture above, we see that spot right there. Oh, my goodness. It's the first spot that I see. Therefore, I'm going to take it. If it's on the first floor, absolutely. Less of a walk for me. If I don't see a spot available into the seventh floor, I'm not going to go up to the 13th floor. Why go up six extra floors when I could park at a much more convenient location on the seventh floor or hopefully the first floor? And so what are we going to look at here for this is what is known as an off bar box. Or sometimes I see it called the Offbaugh arrow diagram. And Offbaugh, like I said, a very German name, actually comes from a German tradition of how they used to build homes in that country. It used to be that the first generation in Germany would build the first floor of a house, you know, start a family, have a son, right? And that son would grow up in that little one story house and get married. And what he would do is he wouldn't go off and build a house of his own on a new plot of land, like a, a lot of you are, you know, itching to get out of your house and move away, they would actually build a second story on top of their parents' house and raise their family in that second story, and it would continue, continue, continue. So you get these houses that are multi-stories tall, right? Now, I don't know what happens when one generation passes away. Do they just – does everyone rotate down? I have no idea, but it's an old tradition in Germany, and so that's actually where that name comes from. And so following the arrows on this chart – this is giving you the order of the sublevels from lowest energy to highest energy. And so what this means is that electrons will always enter the 1s sublevel first. Then it will always enter the 2s sublevel next, and then 2p, and then 3s, and then 3p, and then 4s. 
it's not as intuitive as just counting to one through seven. It's not. Different sublevels have different energy levels, thus the need for this chart. Because notice, 4S actually comes before 3D. So there's little intricacies that you got to get accustomed to uh, and get a little bit of practice with there. Okay, But what this tells you is this is the order from lowest energy to highest energy. It's actually a very simple chart to memorize. All you got to do is count your S's 1 through 7, and then your P's 2 through 6, and your D's 3, 4, 5, and then your F's on the far right. There actually is already a 5F, but and there also is a 7P as well and a 6D. Right? Theoretically, we could go on forever. Right? If they add more elements, there's going to be a need for a larger off bob box. But as it stands right now, this is about all we need. Anyways, moving on to a couple of other terms here that we need to make sure that we're following in order to make sure that our electron configurations are accurate. Hundrel, complicated definition here. Every orbital in a subshell is singly occupied with one electron before any one orbital is doubly occupied, and all electrons in singly occupied orbitals have the same spin. Goodness, that's a mouthful. Try saying that two times fast. Yeah, it can't. I like to think of Hun's rule as a school bus, right? And so we put ourselves in this scenario of me on a school bus. Wow, what a strapping young lad that guy looks like. And so I'm first to arrive on the bus, and of course, lots and lots of kids are waiting to get on to the next few stops. Well, I don't care if you're best friends with the next person. If you have the opportunity to get a bus seat to yourself, you're going to take it. The opportunity to stretch your arms out, kick your legs out, lean back, perhaps even lay down if you're small enough and take a nap, that's way more than the promise of sitting next to your friends and just having a mundane conversation with them for the next 15 minutes. Of course not. So all the next individuals that get on the bus are all going to take their own seat instead of sitting next to each other. You're not going to have two people on the same bus until you – or sorry. You're not going to have two people on the same bus seat until you absolutely have to. So look at these six handsome young lads. They're all in their own seat because they all had the opportunity to get in their own seat. All right, guys. We practice this just like, just like in practice. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Oh, 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 oh it's magic, you know. Never believe it's not so beautiful, beautiful. So anyways, as it stands, you're not going to put two people in the same orbital until you absolutely have to. Maybe whenever you went to some kind of camp during the summer and you had to sleep in bunk beds, right? Yes, when you're young, maybe you strive for those top bunks. But hey, when you get a little bit older, having to climb up under the top bunk after a long day is exhausting. And so personally, I would always go for the bottom bunks, right? And so how you want to think of it as is everyone's going to take a bottom bunk until there's no bottom bunks left. And if there's no bottom bunks left, then of course they have to choose a top bunk. Okay, so that's Hun's rule. We're not going to double occupy an orbital until we absolutely have to. Uh, now, the Pauli exclusion principle is the last rule that we're going to look at here. The Pauli exclusion principle has a more complicated definition. Uh, which states that no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers, uh, which is an, it's a concept that doesn't necessarily have to be explained with electron configuration. So something to look for in a different video, or if we don't ever cover it in one of our videos, look for it elsewhere, okay? I know there's lots of people on the internet doing this kind of thing. But anyways, the simple definition of the Pauli exclusion principle states that two electrons in the same orbital must have opposite spins, okay? If you ever shared a small bed with someone as a kid, right? You couldn't sleep the same direction. One of you, you had to sleep, as they call it, head to toe. One's going this way and one's sleeping this way, right? It saves space. It gives you more space. And so the electrons must occupy, if they're occupying the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. And so now orbital notation is the first way of writing this uh, that we are going, it's the first way that we're going to see electron configuration here. And, and what it is, it's a way of writing an electron configuration to provide more specific information about the electrons in an, atom, in an atom of an element. It allows us to actually have conversations about one specific electron, is what it allows us to do. And every electron is represented with an arrow. And sometimes people get a little lazy and they draw little half arrows, work on your own thing, right? But arrows represent the electrons. And so let's, let's get a different look here. Let's look at our next slide. 
Okay, look at me, transparent. Let me move so you can, you know, actually read this question. We're gonna write the orbital notations of the first of some of the first few elements on the periodic table. Well, we've got hydrogen with one electron, and we've got helium with two electrons, carbon with six electrons, fluorine with nine electrons. These are just the neutral, neutral atoms. Okay, so nothing to worry about there, right? Just neutral atoms. Um, so we're not dealing with the ions here. Well, hydrogen with only one electron, you have to consider that off bar chart. What is the order in which the electrons must enter? What is the order in which these electrons must enter? And so we're going to take a look back at this off bar chart here. Right? Remember, we're thinking this as a parking garage. I am not going to go to the second floor of the parking garage if there's a spot available on the first floor. I am not going to go to the next floor until the one before is absolutely filled. Okay? So if hydrogen only has one electron, then it must enter the 1s sublevel, which is why we're going to see our 1s sublevel and the one electron will enter that. Okay? And remember, we're not going to fill. We're not going to move on to the second story until the first story is absolutely filled. Man, I kind of like looking like a ghost. Anyways, helium has two electrons. And if you recall from one of the slides, you really want to uh, keep your notes out to the side. Um, I know I didn't say at the beginning of the video, but remember the links to these notes are always going to be below the video. The links to these slides and the links to the notes that I actually utilize in class are going to be below the video. Um, anyways, helium has two electrons. And the first sublevel that electrons have to enter is the 1s sublevel. But remember that every orbital can actually hold two electrons. But we must remember that we have to follow the Pauli exclusion principle. So when one electron is spinning up, the other electron has to spin down. Pauli exclusion principle says that if two electrons are in the same spot, they must go opposite directions. Okay? Wow, I can't even see my arms like that. So now let's look at carbon. And we're going to make sure that we're following all of the rules. off bar principle, Pauli exclusion principle, and Hun's rule here. Well, carbon has six electrons, more than we use in the first two examples, of course. Well, the first two have to go into 1s. And only after the 1s sublevel is filled can I move on to the next sublevel. And if you're following that off bar arrow chart, the next sublevel is 2s. Well, all S's are the same. S's can only hold two electrons. But in order to make sure that we're following the Pauli exclusion principle, one has to go up, one has to go down. They must have opposite spins. Well, if you're looking at that off bud chart, what is the next sublevel that follows 2S? 2P. And if you're looking back at one of those reference charts, a P sublevel has three orbitals, and each orbital can hold two electrons. Therefore, it holds a maximum of six electrons. However, we already have one, two, three, four electrons represented here. Carbon only has six, so I only need two more. I'm not going to fill it up all the way if I don't have the electrons to do it. That's like paying for something when you don't have the money. So we only have two more electrons to represent, and the first one's going to get on the school bus. Well, this final electron, this sixth electron, is going to also get on the school bus, but is he going to sit next to his best friend? No, because He's got two different opportunities to sit by himself. And let me tell you, that is much more appealing than sitting next to your best friend for just 10 minutes. Who cares? Stretch your legs a little. I'm going to take my own spot. I'm getting my own seat on the bus. Okay? And so now this orbital diagram is following all of the principles and the rules that we discussed earlier. Hun's rule, off bar principle, and the Pauli exclusion principle. So now let's look at fluorine who has nine electrons. And yes, you can do this for all of the elements on the periodic table. It's just that if you can avoid drawing 118 arrows, wouldn't you? I would. I had to do little animations for each of these in Google Slides, and that's annoying if I had to do that for 118 arrows. I don't want to. Anyways, fluorine, nine electrons. Well, according to the off ball, we're going to go from lowest energy to highest energy. Therefore, the first sublevel that is filled every single time without fail is 1s. And an S can only fit two electrons, one up, one down. After 1S comes 2S, one up, one down. S's can only fit two electrons. And after that comes 2P. Well, fluorine only has nine electrons. We've already covered four. Sorry, we've already covered four of the electrons so far. Therefore, we only need five. P can hold six electrons. However, we are going to do all 
We're going to put one electron in each of these spots before we ever double them up. And so the first three electrons that enter are each going to take their own spot. But now the next electrons that enter, there's no choice but for them to join some of the other arrows in the bus seat, right? They have to share the same seat after this point. And so the last two electrons to enter are going to go right there like so. And it doesn't technically matter which orbital you put these last two electrons in. Um, all orbitals in the same sublevel have the same energy. I just do it from left to right for convenience sake, right? When you're doing a bunch of arrows on your page, it's just convenient to write from left to right because that's, that's how you normally write anything. Um, but this right here, all three of these orbitals within the 2P sublevel have the same amount of energy, so nothing to worry about there. Anyways, let's go back to this slide right here. Now the question is, what is wrong with the following diagram? Well, can we use the terminology that we've learned in this video thus far to actually we, we, we can see that it's wrong, but can you properly properly diagnose why it is wrong? Well, when I'm looking at this here, right, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. So this is most likely to be nitrogen, right? Most likely to be nitrogen. However, it didn't follow the bus seat rule, which its official name is Hun's rule. This electron right here, this down arrow, occupied the same bus seat as his buddy when he had an open seat available. And that's a big no-no, okay? The more complex explanation for Hun's rule is remember that these electrons are all negatively charged and they do not want to be next to each other. Therefore, if we don't have to put two electrons next to each other, we ain't gonna. And so this down arrow should become an up arrow in this third spot. Why does it have to be an up arrow? Because a second condition to Hun's rule is that all electrons in singly occupied orbitals must have the same spin, okay? Can't forget that as well. I would say the more, it's just, it's very simple to do all of your up arrows in a sublevel before doing any of your down arrows. That's how I tackle it, that's how I approach it. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that as well. Uh, a couple of other terms, it's a very conceptual, very term heavy uh, unit in chemistry, electron configuration is. There's Thankfully, there's not really math involved. If you're not a numbers person, there's not really math involved here. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but a couple more terms, diamagnetic and paramagnetic. Diamagnetic is the condition when all orbitals of an atom are doubly occupied, meaning that no electrons are alone. Well, paramagnetic is the exact opposite, when there's at least one orbital with an unpaired electron. So let's go back to our, our picture here. Which of these elements that we covered were diamagnetic? In which situation was every electron buddied up with someone else? Well, the only element that's here that meets that criteria is helium, right? There's only two electrons, and they're in the same bunk bed, the same orbital. Therefore, this is a diamagnetic element. And so all of the, the other three, hydrogen, carbon, and fluorine, are all paramagnetic elements. Fluorine almost, meets, almost fits the bill. But this last electron over here is alone. Therefore, it is a paramagnetic electron. And if you're thinking more intently about this, there's actually only a, a couple of families, only a few families that meet the criteria for diamagnetic as well. And this is this is mostly, mostly talking about neutral atoms. Yes, atoms can lose and gain electrons becoming ions that would make them diamagnetic when they are not naturally a diamagnetic element. But when I'm talking about neutral atoms, the only families that exist naturally as diamagnetic elements are the alkaline earth metals, your noble gases, and as we get deeper into electron configuration, we can also talk about this last family of transition metals. Now, there's some funky stuff that occurs with the electrons in a few of the families, but as long as every electron is buddied up, it is a diamagnetic element. But once again, fluorine could, for example, gain an electron and become diamagnetic. Sodium could lose an electron and become diamagnetic, right? But naturally, most elements occur as paramagnetic elements. Moving on. How do we write full electron configurations? Well, it's the same thing as orbital notation. It's just that we're not going to waste our time writing the arrows, drawing the arrows. So it's a little less uh, ink from your pen, a little lead, less lead from your pencil. So writing the full electron configuration, let's first use sodium as an example. Remember, the most important thing here, so it's not really worried about poly exclusion or Hun's rule here because we can't actually see the arrows. All we have to worry about is off-bah. 
are we filling up the lower energy levels before moving on to the next highest? I'm not going to go to the second floor of the parking garage unless there is not a spot available on the first floor. And so sodium naturally has 11 electrons, as it is number 11 on the periodic table. We are going to fill from lowest energy to highest energy. And using the arrow diagram directly above my face in this video, you can very, very plainly see the order here. We are always going to start with 1s. Well, you have to remember that an s sublevel can only fit two electrons. But in the end, your, uh, your superscripts, they all are your exponents, whatever you want to call them. Your exponents are going to add up to the number of electrons that your element has. So my superscripts are going to add up to 11 in this example, right? Only two electrons can fit in the s, and after 1s comes 2s. Only two electrons can fit in the S sublevel, so after 2S comes 2P. Six electrons can fit into a P sublevel. What comes after 2P? 3S. But at this point, I've already had 10 electrons. All I need is one more. Oh my goodness. It really is like a fancy way of counting. You just have to make sure you fill up the lower level before moving on to the next highest level. So doing a couple more examples, feel free to pause this video right now as you're following along in the notes. The next couple of examples are for you to write the electron configuration of phosphorus and calcium, right? So feel free to pause and attempt to do so. If not, moving on to the answers here. We are counting, and you can go ahead and check for yourself. Phosphorus is element number 15 on the periodic table, and our superscripts, our exponents, are going to add up to 15 in this one. And our exponents for calcium are going to add up to 20 in this one, as it is element number 20. Yes, you can also do this for ions, right? That's just not typically what is asked of you. And now you're saying, oh my goodness, I can only imagine how annoying this would get if I was going way, way, way down into the periodic table. Would I really have to count all of these all the time? <sighs> Heck no! It's beautiful. The periodic table, so intuitively designed for various purposes, and one of those purposes is actually to benefit you in electron configuration. I like to say that the periodic table kind of looks like a castle. Right? We got a couple of the castle towers here and the little lower walls, the front gate. I don't know what this is down here. Let's just call it a moat, whatever it is. But either way, it's very intuitively designed. Think back. How many electrons can fit in an S sublevel? Only two. What did sodium end with? 3S1. Well, let's think about that in terms of the periodic table. Sodium is on the third row, and he's in the first column. <gasps> Notice how this sort of castle tower, as we called it, is sort of separate from the rest of the periodic table. And there's only two columns in this tower. Huh, convenient. Notice how this section over here, this other castle tower, is sort of separate from the rest of the periodic table. And notice that it has one, two, three, four, five, six elements across. Goodness gracious. What sublevel can fit six electrons in it? One bigger than an S. It is the P sublevel. And so, by golly, we're starting to see a pattern form. The periodic table is structured to match the sublevels of the electron configurations of the elements within it. And so, sodium is right here. He's on the third row, and he was in the first column. Therefore, sodium would have all of its sublevels filled, but it would end with 3S1, and everything that comes before 3S would be completely filled. And if you're going to look one over, magnesium, which is right here on the periodic table, would end with 3s2. Let's go back one slide. Phosphorus is number 15 on the periodic table. It ends with 3p3. Phosphorus is found on the third period of the periodic table, and it's found right here. Conveniently, the third element in this 3p row that you're seeing on the periodic table. And yes, it works for the other sublevels that we haven't necessarily talked about, uh, the D and the F sublevel so far, but it works for them as well. However, there is a caveat to it. If you're looking at the off Bob box, uh, the only sublevel that exists in the first energy ring is an S, one S. There's no one P, there's no one D, there's no one F, right? There used to be a one D, but then they split up and went their separate directions, right? Uh, gosh, Zane for life though, Zane for life. Anyways, there's only a one S sublevel. And in the second energy level, there's no two D, there's no two F. But there is a 2p. Every time you go, every time you go down in energy level, 
you're actually adding a new sublevel to the mix. And so we don't actually get a D sublevel until 3D. And so when we're looking at the periodic table utilizing this shortcut, we don't actually see a D sublevel until the fourth row. And so although our S's and our P's perfectly match the rows that they're sitting on, you have to internalize that although this is the fourth row, this is actually 3D. And then on your periodic table, this is technically in the sixth row, if you're looking back here, since it goes 55, 56, 57, and then goes to 58, and this is the F block of the periodic table, right? You have to internalize that this is 4F and this is 5F. So your Ds lag behind one, and your Fs lag behind two, which matches what you're going to see in your arrow chart directly above me, right? You hit the 4S sublevel, and then you go back to the 3D sublevel, and then you proceed on to the 4P. You hit the 6S sublevel, but then you go back to the 4F sublevel, and then you proceed on to the 5D, okay? So you have to internalize this. If you understand the shortcut to the periodic table, well, then you have no need to memorize the chart directly above. It's very intuitive for you. That being said, error chart very handy, and not everyone actually understands this shortcut to the periodic table. So, but let's get a little bit of practice with it. So doing a few examples here, sometimes we just get questions where it simply says, identify the element of this electron configuration. Well, what you could do is you could add up all of these exponents and get the total number of electrons, because that would tell you what element number it is. or you could simply look at the final component of the electron configuration, which in this example is 3P1, and utilizing our shortcut, all we have to do is go to row 3, the P section, and it's the first element here. And if you're looking at your periodic table, that, of course, is going to be aluminum. Like I said, you could have counted all of the exponents up, added them all up to 13, or you can simply use that shortcut method. And so I understand 1s2, 2s1, that's really easy to count to 3, or 2s1, 2s1, the first element that's here in this block right here. So a little bit of practice here, and this is what opens up the door for one of my favorite chemistry games, one of the great American pastimes in regards to chemistry. Not only baseball, but periodic table battleship, right? When you're stuck at home in quarantine, you call up... Uh, your, your your lady love or the guy that you, you really think is adorable in class, you call him up and you go, hey, you want to play a little periodic table battleship? Well, let me tell you, I'm firing at 5P2. Gosh darn it, you've hit my battleship. You're on, Angelica, whatever your name is, right? Put your boats on the periodic table and take aim. And try to sink your opponent. It's a beautiful, beautiful game. And lots of relationships have blossomed from there. And that's just a little bit of advice in the middle of this video. So now, looking at this final example here that you have in your notes, I could count all of it up. Or I could simply look at the fact that it ends with 3D7. Now, remember what's special about the D sublevel is that it lags behind 1. And so, even though it says 3D7, I'm going to actually look at the fourth row and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spots over. Or if you're doing that on a real periodic table so you don't have to memorize all of your elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Mr. Cobalt, right? You've identified it as Cobalt. Like I said, you could add up all the exponents, but if you're talking about elements way down here, what's the point? You've got the shortcut. All right. So now, now you might be asking yourself, well, are you ever going to ask me to write the full electron configuration of elements down here? Because that really would be annoying. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10. It just goes on and on and on. I don't want to do that. Well, thankfully, you do not have to. As the third and final way of writing these electron configurations is known as the noble gas configuration, which is a shortcut to writing these electron configurations. And so what it entails, or what you are entailed to do, is you have to take the noble gas that occurs before the element that you are concerned with. In this example, we're going to be looking at strontium. You take the noble gas that would occur before strontium, and you put it in brackets. And by putting it in brackets, you are representing the entire electron configuration of that 
element, whatever the noble gas is that you've selected, within those brackets. And then you simply pick up where that noble gas left off. So for example, for strontium, right? If we're looking at the periodic table, strontium number 38 on the periodic table, the noble gas that occurs before him is krypton. Well, if we put krypton in brackets, then everything that leads up to krypton is going to be represented in that bracket. And if you're using the periodic table shortcut, which is very, very, very handy, every element except for helium, every noble gas element except for helium is actually going to end with the shortcut blank P6. Whatever row it's on, except for helium, which is going to end with 1S2, every other noble gas is going to end with blank P6. Neon, for example, will end with 2P6. Argon, 3P6. Krypton, as we're just looking at, 4P6. Xenon, 5P6. Radon, 6P6. Right? They're all going to end with 6P6. And if you're looking at the arrow chart or if you're looking at what directly occurs after utilizing the periodic table shortcut, well, then you know where to pick up after the noble gas leaves off. And so, for example, if krypton in my example right here that we're utilizing with strontium leaves off at 4P6, what occurs after 4P? Well, it's 5S. But on top of that, we're also trying to write the noble gas configuration for strontium. Utilizing the shortcut, what should he end with? What should strontium end with? Well, notice he's on row 5. He's in the S block of the periodic table, and he's the second column. Therefore, strontium should end with 5S2. On top of that, look at this. We're giving you all different ways to think about this. Krypton has 36 electrons. Put that in brackets. That's 36 electrons. I only need two more after that. But I can't just start off at the beginning. Right? I can't just put Krypton in brackets and then say 1s2. It's very tempting. But remember that 1s was covered whenever I put the Krypton in brackets. And so we're going to see that in total, at the end, right? this is the full electron configuration for this guy. But remember that Krypton does everything up to 4p6. What's the only thing that comes after 4p6? 5s2. The 36 electrons of Krypton represented in the bracket then all you need is the leftover pieces to get you to strontium. And that's so bad, right? So now, let's ask you, go ahead and pause this video. The next question in your notes is for you to write the noble gas configuration for bromine. Right? Go ahead and pause it if you don't want the answer spoiled for you. If not, we're going to press on. Here's our answer. Right? If we're utilizing the shortcut for bromine, bromine is right here on the periodic table, number 35. He's in the P section of the periodic table. He's on row four, and he is the one, two, three, four, fifth element in that P block. So I know that bromine should end with 4P5, but what about everything that occurs before him? If we're utilizing the noble gas configuration, you have to take the noble gas that occurs before him, argon, and put it in brackets. And what this does is this takes every electron that was entered into the sublevels um, up to argon's point, but we have to pick up where it leaves off. So you can either use the off bar box directly above because you know that argon is going to end with 3p6. So what comes after 3p up there? Or if you understand what's occurring with the periodic table shortcut here, then you know that after argon comes 4s2, and after 4s comes 3d10, and then all I got to do is get to bromine, which is 4P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so my final answer when everything is all said and done is argon in brackets, 4S2, 3D10, 4P5, as we just said. Okay? Now, there are a couple of exceptions to electron configuration that we're going to talk about here. And this is actually primarily uh, talking about only a couple of families on the periodic table. It does occur outside of these families, but primarily, uh, as far as pre-AP chemistry or high school chemistry goes, it's primarily concerned with these families. But either way, um, gonna put a little light bulb to a couple of things here, right? And, and if you have any kind of science background and you're watching this video, you might kind of cringe at this explanation. Uh, it, it's not the true explanation, right? But it's the most simple explanation on how we can arrive to the conclusion that we're going to. 
So my, my first question is, what would you think the electron configuration for chromium would be? Well, if we look at where chromium is positioned on the periodic table, he's right here. And if we're using the periodic table shortcut, this is row 4, but this is 3D, and he should end with Let's backtrack. So where is chromium uh, located on the periodic table? Well, he is in row four, but remember that this is the 3D section of the periodic table. And we would expect him to end with one, two, three, four, 3D4. That's what I expect. Just like I see in this visual right here. Argon in brackets, 4S2, 3D4. And sorry, I, I put the orbital notation on here to... Uh, give a little bit more of a visual and look here are those little half arrows I was talking about a little bit earlier in the video feel free feel free to use those if you're ever asked to write orbital notation so this is what I would expect the orbital notation for chromium to be and yet it isn't actually what occurs and once again like I said if you have any science background you might cringe at this right but this is the most simple way of explaining it what if I told you that a half filled or a completely filled sublevel is more stable than a partially filled sublevel OK, now that is not the concrete explanation. That's not the absolute truth. And yet it gives us a starting point on what families and what elements are actually going to undergo this change that we're going to see. The real truth behind it is that the change that we're going to see here in a second is that the electrons are simply putting themselves in the most comfortable position. It's just like you might think to yourself, I sleep on my side at night. I'm not knocking sleeping on my back. I've had great naps while sleeping on my back, but I simply prefer to sleep on my side. And so what's going to happen is these electrons are going to move around in order to put themselves in a more comfortable position. So think of it like this. Chromium like this is currently sleeping on his back when he's more comfortable with sleeping on his side. So some electrons are going to move. One electron, actually. And we're going to use this line of thinking. What if I told you that a half-filled or a completely filled sublevel is more stable than a partially filled sublevel? Well, actually, this scenario that we're presenting to you right now only is, is only going to primarily take place with these two families, right? Family 6 and family 11 on the periodic table. Because as it stands, chromium is one electron away from becoming half-filled in the D sublevel. And if we look at family 11... You could write out its electron configuration. It's one away from having a filled D sublevel. And so what occurs is one electron is removed from the valence shell from 4S and is shifted into the 3D sublevel. Okay? So it's shifted into the 3D sublevel, and now it has a half-filled sublevel. But remember, the, the real explanation behind this is it's simply a more comfortable position. All of these electrons are negatively charged. They do not want to be next to each other. They do not want to be next to each other. And so by putting this electron that was originally right here, it was the down arrow in this 4S box, by putting it into a lower energy sublevel, it's a more comfortable position. And the element actually invests energy to move this electron into this sublevel, and yet when it's done, it's a worthwhile investment because it's more comfortable. Right? Just like you rolling over at night, you're investing energy to do that, but you're more comfortable. You sleep more soundly in doing that. And so using this line of thinking, right, we're going to do this with the next family, family 11 as well. But this is our true electron configuration of chromium right here. Argon in brackets, 4S1, 3D5. It's a more stable electron arrangement. Okay. So now using this line of thinking, what would it be for copper? What would it be for copper? which is right here, family 11 on the periodic table. Well, originally, before this conversation, you would have thought that copper would be argon in brackets, 3D9, 4S2. Who could blame you? We haven't told you otherwise. And yet, a completely filled D sublevel is more stable than a partially filled sublevel. And so what's going to occur is that one electron is going to get taken from the S sublevel, just like it was for chromium, and put into the D sublevel, like so. And so what we actually end with is argon 4s1 3d10. And actually, 
the way that this is written, I'm sorry, is actually incorrect according to the Aqua chart. If you see directly above, 4S should be written before 3D uh, in terms of the energy. Okay. So now those are our exceptions. Which remember, it, it as we can see right here, it occurs in other elements on the periodic table. And it occurs in other elements on the periodic table aside from this table as well. Um, it's just that family 6 and 11 are the ones that are primarily discussed in high school. That's all it is. So now let's talk about electron configurations of inner transition metals. Um, really, the, the thing you want to grasp here is really pay attention to how many electrons you should end with. right? If an element has 99 electrons, then you need to make sure that your electron configuration ends with 99 electrons. Period. End of story. Um, because there's a couple ways you can get caught up here, and the internet actually, if you search the electron configuration of certain inner transition metals, uh, the lanthanides and the actinides, you usually get two different answers, actually. And it actually depends on your periodic table and how it's written. Notice very subtle differences. Lanthanum and actinium are right here on the periodic table, but down here on this periodic table, lanthanum and actinium are down in the bottom. On top of that, some scientists consider lanthanum and actinium to actually be F block elements when in other periodic tables are considered to be D block elements. And so this can kind of throw off your electron configurations. And so when we look at the electron configurations of these inner transition metals, I technically, when, when I'm in my class, I consider both of these to be correct. Okay. The internet primarily leans towards this option right here, and it's for a, a couple of different reasons, I would imagine. One, it depends on the periodic table you're using and the different line of thinking that you're using. If you consider these two elements right here to be F-block elements, well, then I understand where you're coming from. But also on top of that, that electron shift that we saw in chromium and copper, like I said, occurs in many more elements. A lot of them are these inner transition elements down here. And so what you really want to make sure you're doing with this is you're either just going to use what most of the Internet does and just consider those all F block elements. Or if you're utilizing this periodic table right here with lanthanum and actinium, you have to remember that after these S blocks, after 6S1, 6S2, lanthanum is the next element, which technically is a 5D1 electron. Right? That's the way that I was taught when I was in high school. This is 5D1. And so if you're utilizing the periodic table shortcut, and the one, the, the problem that we're looking at here in our notes is write the noble gas configuration for promethium, PM, on the periodic table. Well, promethium, according to our shortcut, should be, and remember this is 4F down here, 4F1, 4F2, 4F3, 4F4. It should end with 4F4. And yet, if we're using the arrow chart and we go in order of all these sublevels, we don't actually get to 61 electrons, we get to 60 electrons, which means we're missing one electron. And where is that electron? He's right here. It's lanthanum. That's where a lot of people often miss that. And so you can either write it e either way. Now, your teacher might want it a certain way. Um, personally, with my kids, I accept both ways. Um, but I have seen a lot of people stress this way right here as well. Uh, and so for Einsteinium, same exact story. You can do it how the internet presents it usually, or you can do it the other way, the other way the periodic table is written, make, making sure to include that 61 electron. And actually, sorry, this 6D should occur after 5F. Ooh, making some edits on the fly, people. Not so bad, right? And so just make sure you're tracking your electrons, right? For example, if I'm doing Einsteinium, and Einsteinium is number 99 on the periodic table, I want to make sure that my electrons add up to 99. If they don't add up to 99, I did something wrong. I didn't do Einsteinium. I did something else. And now finally, the last uh, couple things we're going to look at is Lewis dot structures and one final term known as isoelectric or isoelectronic. I have seen it written both ways. Um, Lewis dot structures and what is known as the octet rule. Well, what you need to know is that virtually every element on the periodic table hungers and craves to have eight valence electrons. And that means to have eight electrons in their outer ring. Valence electrons are the electrons located in the outer ring. Anything that is not in the outer ring is not a valence electron. It is considered an inner electron. And virtually every element on the periodic table craves to have eight. Why? It is the most stable electron configuration possible. 
And so think in your elements. What, who do you know the elements that are the happiest as it stands right now? They don't need a reaction. It's the noble gases. Why are they already happy? It's because they already have that eight valence electrons in their outer ring, right? Except for helium, right? There are a few exceptions. Helium does only have two. It's a very stable configuration nonetheless. Um, and our other main exception to this is hydrogen. Hydrogen is also very content with having uh, two electrons. Just like helium, it's also content with losing an electron. Um, but there are several exceptions. It's just this is the main one that we see along with helium as well. But there's also a very, very easy way of drawing these Lewis dot structures. Um, and so we're going to take a look at how we draw them. And what you do is you simply put the elements symbol. And then each dot you put around the element symbol is going to represent an electron. Right? And there are a few rules. There's only one little rule that you want to follow here. You have to have a dot on every side of that symbol before you ever double them up. Kind of think of it like the Huns rule. Slightly different, but kind of think of it that way. Um, but very simple shortcut for determining how many valence electron an element has, specifically in the A group elements, which means anyone on the outside, anyone that's not a transition um, metal or an inner transition metal. So 1, 2, and then the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 over here. Sorry, any of the A blocks, which this one is labeled. Notice how these are labeled B block elements. 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. Whatever that number is in front of the A, that's how many valence electrons they have. Right? So, for example, sodium is in the 1A group and therefore would have one valence electron, would have one dot. Chlorine is in the 7A group and therefore would have seven dots. Right? Now, you can't, it doesn't matter which side you start on, right, top, right, bottom, left, it, it doesn't matter. I tend to just start on the right and work my way around in a clockwise pattern. Remember, put one dot, one dot on each side before ever doubling them up. And then here, we can actually see um, elements 1 through 20 in all of their Lewis dot structures. It's not structured the exact same way as the periodic cable, right? They actually completely eliminated that transition metal section of the periodic cable. But even so, you can see that the elements in the same family have the same amount of valence electrons, and that's very, very, very important. Now think in your head, what about those transition metals? What about the ones that we just eliminated? How many valence electrons would they have? Well, valence electrons are the electrons in your outer ring. It's not necessarily the last electrons that you write in the electron configuration. And so when I'm writing the electron configuration for some of these uh, transition metals, right? let's go back to one of our examples um, way back when, when we found that this was cobalt. The electron configuration is 3p6, 4s2, 3d7. Well, how many valence electrons does he have? Does he have seven? Or maybe I add everything in the third energy ring, two plus six plus seven. So that's eight plus seven, which is 15. But I can only have a max of eight valence electrons uh, for the most part. So that doesn't work. What you do is you look at the highest energy level. And the highest energy level is whatever your largest coefficient is. And so the largest coefficient that I achieve is actually the number four. And so cobalt only has two valence electrons. In fact, almost every transition metal has two valence electrons. Now think in your head, what are the families that don't have two valence electrons? Da, 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 da. That's right. It's those exceptions that we were talking about earlier. The ones that exhibit a shift in their electrons, and therefore, chromium is only going to have one valence electron, actually. With its electron configuration, 4s1, 3d5, it only has one electron in that outer energy level. And so the very last thing that we're going to close with today is one final term, isoelectronic or isoelectric. Once again, I have seen it written both ways. Atoms are isoelectronic or isoelectric with one another when they have the same number of electrons, therefore the same electron configuration, assuming that we are in the ground state. If we're not in the ground state, then they don't necessarily have the same electron configuration. Um, but let's just assume that we are in the ground state. Well, like I said before, electrons are getting shifted around all the time. In fact, that's the reason why these valence electrons are so, so, so important. Valence electrons actually determine most of the chemical behaviors exhibited. Everyone is striving for that octet in the outside, right? And that's the reason for these reactions that we see. Elements are going to lose electrons. Elements are going to gain electrons in order 
to achieve that stable configuration. And so we end up seeing a lot of elements having the same electron configuration with one another after these chemical reactions take place. For example, if potassium were to lose an electron, looking at where it is on the periodic table, potassium in its neutral state has 19. But if it were to lose an electron, well, it would have the same electron configuration as neutral argon. And chlorine, if he were to gain an electron, that's why we see that negative charge there, chlorine is number 17 on the periodic table. If he were to gain an electron, would also have 18 electrons. And assuming we're at the ground state, they would all have the same electron configuration. But if you ever ask a question about isoelectronic or isoelectric, all you have to do is count how many electrons these atoms have. Ladies and gentlemen, that is everything that electron configuration has to offer. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're washing your hands. And I hope you're having a great time and discovering a little bit about yourself. Maybe picking up a new hobby. Make, making sure that you're, you're, you're staying physically active. I'd like to recommend that you do the 100 push-up and 100 squats a day challenge. Right? It's very good to stay fit. Right? Maybe gain a little bit of muscle in some areas that you were hoping for. And stay in limber. Okay? Don't just eat a bag of Lay's chips every day. That is not a strong diet. Okay? Try some broccoli. Maybe some Brussels sprouts. Delicious. Have a great day. Have a great quarantine. Stay safe.